something a little different and you can see that I have no makeup on and I'm doing something that I swore that I would never do which is do a video while doing makeup talking about murder and history I failed okay so first off just off the top this is not a, a look that I think you should be wearing out on a day-to-day -day basis unless it's your thing feel free to um, I'm actually going to be doing a recreation of an 18th century look like this um, when you think of the 18th century I think everybody immediately begins to think about uh, pale skin and you one of the biggest challenges for individuals during that time was covering up pockmarks and paint filled those spots in, covered up uh, color issues. I mean, it's the same thing that we have today, right? That we use schlack for, or sh spackle um, primer for, and that kind of thing. So just to give a basis, I have already cleansed my face. My skin is really dry today, so this might go poorly, but uh, I'm gonna try it anyways. Uh, I've put on uh, Smashbox's oil-based primer just to give my skin a little extra kick. Uh, of moisture and to make it feel a little better. Now, I want to get into the story and I'll talk to you a little bit about cosmetics as we go through this story, but let's try for me to do this makeup and talk about the Princess de la Mel and hopefully not look like a complete goob by the time this is done. I've never done this before. I don't know how this is going to look. So, Let's do this together. Okay, so the very first thing, as I've already said, I've primed my skin, and we want to, to me, they had a very smooth, soft, pale skin. And I don't, you know, I bought some ultralight, um, some ultralight base to do that, to make my skin look super light, but I'm just not sure it's going to give me that look that I want. And look, I'll... I'll even do it a little more so we get a little extra in there. And I'm just spritzing my sponge so this evens out. Yeah, see, I'm really pale, you guys, and the light is probably not helping, but I'm so pale that this is really not making much of a difference. So I'll go ahead and do this on the other side too, just to make the makeup even since I'm going to make myself more pale, and I will give you my secret to that shortly. Okay. So, the person we're talking about today is the Princess de Lamballe. And why is she important in history? Well, I don't want to tell you that part yet, because that's kind of an interesting thing about her. So, let's first start and talk about who she was. So, first off, she was the daughter of the Prince of Carniano, and also the daughter of Christine of Hesse, Raphael's Rottenberg, a ton of German names. Um, and it was, Christine was a land graven. And I'm going to point this out because I find this really interesting for the SCA. Um, we have a duke, which is your highest rank besides king and queen and a prince and princess. And then we have um, count and countess. And land graven in German, the Holy Roman Empire specifically, was actually a rank that is in between duke and count. So she was the daughter of Christine of Hesse, Rottenberg, Rice, so many names, so many German names, who was a Landgraven. And like I said before, it's an in-between rank that the Holy Roman Empire created. Um, and they basically ruled like city-states. Her name when she was born, the Christian name that she was given, was Marie Therese Louis, Louise of Savoy Carnegie. And she from henceforth on shall be called MT through the rest of this. So we're going to call her Marie Therese one more time so her name stays with you. Marie Therese was from a very ancient family in um, France, the House of Savoy. It was a rich, rich royal line and um, you know the only family that had more prestige than them would have been the Bourbons. And um, the Bourbons had obviously the throne and had had the throne for a significant amount of time by this point. Okay, I have the my base put on and I'm going to turn this light just a little bit and see if you can see my skin a little better. 
Um, the Bourbons had been in power for a very long time by this point, but that does not mean that there were not other ruling families who had uh, royal blood in them that weren't just as powerful. So, um, King Louis the Fifteenth at the time had been looking for a match for King Louis the Fourteenth's great grandson, and that great grandson's name um, was what was his name? Louis, Louis, Louis. Always whining. Not quite the same movie, but his name was Louis, and he was an altogether very, very interesting character. Um, if we could call him a playboy wanton cad, I think we might be being kind to him. He was the epitome of a man whore. And, you know, as my husband would call him a meat slinging fool, he, he just wasn't happy with Marie Therese. And, and MT's father-in-law, Louis's father, who was the Prince of Lambelle, Louis was. Um, he really wanted Louis to settle down and hoped that Marie Therese's very pious nature, very laid back, gentle nature, would accomplish that task. Um, unfortunately, as we stated, he's a man whore. And so he, even though their first few months of marriage was really beautiful and they seemed to care about each other and were attracted to each other physically, eventually he started shacking back up with his mistresses. So that's cool. K thanks, Louis. Um, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you. So uh, I'm not really going to tell you the brushes that I use because I'm cheap and I use cheap brushes and they're just as good as ritzy, 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 ritz brushes. brushes. Um, but what I am using, and this is my cosplay trick, um, I don't know if you can see it, it is Manic Panic and yeah, goth days. It is Manic Panic uh, Vampire's Veil Press Powder. And this particular color is Moonlight. And I actually could go up like a whole pale, a shade paler. And I do have it, but I don't have it with me. So what I'm just doing is I've put this over that really light base to give us that really, really nice 18th century soft palette. I, I, you know, I'm, I look pretty pallid here. I'm going to be honest with you. Is pallid the word? I'm, I look pale. It's pallid. I was right. I'm not wrong. It's pallid. Um, you could probably see, like, right here underneath my eyes how much paler I actually okay. am. So, let's get back to Louis, 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 always wanting Louis. Um, so, Louis was, and I'm just buffing this powder onto my face, you guys. I'm doing nothing spectacular. And it does, um, you can... Um, apply it and keep leveling up. The coverage gets thicker and thicker as you continue to apply it. So don't be scared of it. Um, except I will say this, you need to really make sure you're moisturized, ladies. If you're my age, which is almost 40, um, you're really wanting to have some kind of moisture on your skin. Otherwise, you're going to get powder and wrinkles that you've never even known that you had and you're not going to like that at all. Okay, so here's the thing. We're done with this facial for piece right now. And you can actually see how much lighter my face is than my neck. So Louis behaved for a hot second. And then he started whoring around again. And Louis was out riding one day, fell off his horse, uh, pretty much became feeble and, and, and infirmed. And when, you know, he she, MT came to his deathbed and she took care of him while he was dying. He had a really advanced form of syphilis and he was extremely young. So, you know, I don't know if he just had syphilis usually takes longer than this to um, actually end someone's life. But either way, it didn't work well for him. And he died of a venereal disease in the long run. And Marie Therese was then a single woman, but something that's, I think, really great and did not happen, I don't think, too often. Uh, Louis's father actually really cared for MT and decided to take her on and have her help him in his charitable works. So he basically took her as a his own daughter after that, and she kept the title the Princess of Lombal. And she went to court and started messing around in the French court. And at that time, something very, very, very exciting happened. And that was that Marie Antoinette was now a princess of France. 
So she started running around in the same circles as Marie Antoinette. And, you know, Marie... Marie gets a really bad rap, and we're not going to really go too deep into her today, but she does get a really bad rap, and um, as the as their relationship, her Marie Antoinette and Marie Therese's relationship grows, they become very, very close, almost sisterly. Their bond is extraordinarily strong, and then when Marie becomes queen, she gives Marie Therese a very, very important position, which is um, like a bed chamberlain, basically. She was the, she would get the the queen ready every day. She took care of finances, household issues. So she was basically the queen's right-hand woman. And that was a very coveted position. And there were plenty of other nobility who, in all, by all rights, probably, I don't want to say deserved, but had right to that position more than Marie Therese did. And so uh, as the French Revolution starts to unfold and the people begin to really hate Marie Antoinette. That also spills over into the Princess Lumball. And unfortunately for her, that comes in the form of the fact that she has all this money as the heir to the uh, Lumball throne, I guess, so to speak, or the, the fortune. And she chooses instead of n- not taking pay yearly from Marie Antoinette and Louis, which by all rights means that taking it from the French people, she chooses instead to continue to take that, I think it's 50,000 livres uh, every year, and um, that pisses off the French people. So they hate her, and they hate her in ways that you can't, I mean, I think Marie Antoinette is the only person that they hate more than her and, uh, and Louis, and she gets pornographic material made of her and Marie Antoinette, making fun of them, these pamphlets, these propaganda pamphlets that go around saying that they're lovers and that there's all kinds of sexual things happening between them. And, I mean, it's basically like how Rome paints dicks on walls. You walk out in the middle of Paris and the French Revolution Aries are just, you know, tossing around these pamphlets. So, you know, we get... We get closer to the very unfortunate events of um, the French Revolution when like when it gets really really bad we call um, those I, at least I call them the September massacres when I think it starts getting just atrocious okay maybe not atrocious maybe it's just when my brain says okay I've had enough of this mayhem um, so you know in it, all this time goes on, the French Revolution's happened. They hate her. Marie Therese and, and Marie Antoinette are really good friends. And then the French Revolution hit. So the royal family has been imprisoned in the Tuileries at this point. And, um, the, you know, they've had, they have a very small household now. And Marie Therese has been gone out um, on a holiday and when she returns October 7th of 1789 um, she comes back to the French court and all this nasty propaganda is now everywhere and she can't avoid it at all anymore Um, but at this point she knows that the king and queen are imprisoned and what she's been doing while she was on this holiday was also going to nearby countries trying to rally support for the king and queen uh, get these other countries to come in and help them out well this to me right here is something that i find really amazing about marie therese and that is part of the constitution um the new constitution, the new French constitution, stated that Marie Antoinette, I think they called uh, called it monarchical constitution, Marie Antoinette was not allowed to have any people on her staff that was not in her presence. And so because Marie Therese was not in her presence, they forced um, Marie Antoinette to write to Marie Therese and tell her, either you return or you have to resign. And this to me speaks volumes to the character of Marie Therese when she got the note she actually said to the captors of the royal family I must live and die with her 
responding to Marie Antoinette. And to me, that was a woman saying, this is my friend, I care about her, I'm going to stick with her and stay by her side. Okay, I'm gonna pause talking about this for one second so we can move on So, in, to, with the makeup. So, you know, in the 18th century, eye makeup is not a real big deal, you guys. Um, I'm sure there is a little bit, but I don't, I don't see it anywhere. You can't really tell in any paintings and portraits. The one thing that you can tell, though, is that um, there's almost this really dark waterline on their upper lid. And so I'm going to attempt to not look like a goob, apply this waterline, and continue to tell you about the Princess Lumball. So um, at one point, like I said, the Princess Lumball and Marie Therese our Marie Trees, the Princess Lumball, and Marie Antoinette, they're still, oh look, I did some of it. They're now in the Tuileries. And then, unfortunately, a mob attacks the Tuileries one night. And the mob is angry. They want Louis' head. Oh my God, how do people talk and do this at the same time? They want Louis' head. And and you know what? Also, all you makeup gurus out there, don't yell at me for holding up my eye. I'm 40 years old. I'm doing the best that I can. Okay, I'm not 40. I'm 38. Sorry, someone's going to say something. Um, anyways, so Marie Antoinette is attacked. And Marie Therese actually stands up for her and protects her, takes hits from the angry mob that arrives. And when that happens... Um, the French Constitution, constitutionalists, the monarchalists, or how whatever they're called, the revolutionaries, um, damn Robespierre, uh, they decide to move the royal family further into a, another prison, which was, which is within the Tuileries, called the Temple, and the Temple is far more sparse. It's really just not a nice place, and. Um, you know, they, they say they put her there to save her, but I think we all know how that story ends. But, um, at the time of all of this happening, the French Revolution had these things called the People's Tribunals that would happen. And basically, okay, you can see how I did the waterline. In case anybody doesn't know what a waterline is, that's, it's like this under part of your eye. Instead of putting eyeliner down onto this top, you're putting eyeliner up under. Some people just do this number. I can't do that. I try and then I end up poking myself and then I end up getting eyeliner everywhere and it looks awful. So these people's tribunals are basically like monkey trials. I know that like mock trials and they are awful. I mean they're just they're trash and their whole purpose the only design is to basically make fun of the individuals that are on trial. <laughs> they take Marie Therese away from Marie Antoinette and her family, and they put her in La Force prison, which is a prison that is meant for prostitutes for the most part. Um, I wanna point out something. This is a really great liquid rouge that is historically inspired, and it was created by the Cat House specifically for me. I have not used it yet, so what I'm going to do is do one cheek with this and see how it works, and then we'll move on. Um, if it doesn't work well, I'll move and do it on the other one. Um, the In the portraits, they sort of did this triangle look, and triangle's probably a little too harsh, but this sort of curved underneath the whole cheek look. So that's what we're going for right now. It's, I'm going to fail it, but we're going to try. So here we are. Marie Therese is in this prison and she's been there for a little while. Two years, in fact, and almost two years. And finally her tribunal comes, this people's tribunal. And what they tell her is they call her in and they ask her, does she love France? Does she believe in liberty? Does she believe, oh, look how pretty. Oh, look at least this really great color. There's, I think, crushed berries and strawberries in this. Um, it leaves a very, very interesting colorscape on me. So, and I'm gonna go ahead and do it on the other cheek because I actually really like it. Um, 
They ask her, does she believe in liberty? Does she believe in freedom for France? And she says, yes, of course I do. I, I believe in liberty for people. I believe in um, ensuring people's rights. And then they want her to denounce any love in her heart for kings and queens. And of course, she is close friends with Marie Antoinette and Louis and that family. And she absolutely outright refuses to denounce them. Um, these tribunals were very weird in the way that, I say weird, they were very uh, misleading in the way that they would basically, and I'm bringing this down below my cheekbone, you guys, because like I said, in the portraits, it's sort of this rounded, almost triangular shape, and some pictures that actually goes way down here, um, and also, P.S., court makeup in France, early period, was early period, meaning 17th century, um, 18th century earlier, was very much that sort of lead paint thick, but we're talking about the time period of Princess Lamballe, and that was not this dramatic darkness. They were looking for a more natural look, so this is the more natural version of the super high rouge, super pink uh, cheeks and lips. So, and I actually really like this. Thank you, Cat House, for my gift. Um, uh, so these people tribunals were, they were just very misleading in the way that once they made their decision about whether or not you were guilty or innocent, they wouldn't just say you're guilty or you're free. They would, they would say, we release you. And that release, however, could be to an angry mob of people or possibly free, but I don't think the free part happened too very often. Um, so here she is she answered the question life liberty love yes i believe in france viva la france she's she's there with them yes and then when they ask her about the king and queen being a royalist being a true friend she absolutely refuses to denounce marie antoinette and in an act in a statement of ultimate sacrifice she actually uses that word and says I have made the sacrifice of my life when they ask her, is she sure about her love for the king and queen? All right, before I go on, this is a content warning. This is about to get gross and I'm gonna do my lips and then we're gonna finish this story real quick. And we're going to have, I hope everyone's gonna have a very, very awesome Halloween. And this is also um, by the cat house as well. It's um, a, a a rouge, a lipstick, lip gloss, and it um, is giving me just this real, look, I got it all over my, my finger. That's awesome. It is giving me this just really pretty, pretty pout. And I just want to say thanks one more time to the Cat House for this tin as well. And they accommodated me with no nuts. I am allergic to almonds. Um, tree nuts specifically, almonds are the worst. So they made this specifically for me. And look, it has a very pretty pout. Um, I just want you to look at my face. Again, I have my waterline kind of giving that dark depth to my eye. My porcelain skin, my cute little rosy cheeks, or I'm calling them my cute little rosy cheeks, and then my little pout. So that really is an 18th century face, but I'm not done. I'm gonna put on the wig before we're all said and done. But while we do that, I'm gonna talk, finish this story, and I'm gonna put eyebrows on while we talk about it. So, we're talking again about M.T. Marie Therese. She says, no way. I love these people. I'm not giving them up. And I know that by saying that I won't give them up, I've just given up my life. So, that's a real rough call to make. So, this is the content warning part, guys. Things do not end well for Marie Therese. Uh, also, in the 18th century, half moon shapes were really, really popular. So I'm going to really kind of soften as much as I can the curve and the arch of my eyebrow out while, while I'm telling you about all this. So Marie Therese did not fare well. I could give you all of the tales of uh, brutality that supposedly happened against her, but there are actual documents. There were people who witnessed things. There were people who saw it, wrote it down, um, and uh, know exactly what happened to her. Um, some people say that she was raped for hours, tortured for hours, but the truth of the matter is she stepped out into an angry mob 
and was hit by a pikeman across the head. And it didn't kill her instantly, but it did knock her down, and blood did go everywhere. And we know that because a gentleman recognized her, who was a, a nobleman, was escaping or leaving the scene and went past her and recognized her by her really, really lovely porcelain skin that I hope that I have accomplished tonight myself. And her beautiful blonde curls. So they were very aware of who she was just by her looks alone. And she still had on her silks. Um, you know, I'm sure they were dingy, but that's still a far cry better than I imagine what most people had at that time. And so we know, he wrote that down in his diary. He saw that happen to her. And see, again, I'm trying to curb that eyebrow. This eyebrow likes to be super arched because it's Ash's angry brow. Um, in the end, they then carried her over to a pile of corpses, laid her on top of the corpse, stabbed her so many times that no one can keep counting. I'm sure no one did at the time, but stabbed her multiple times. They removed her arms and her legs, and they severed her head. They disemboweled her, and then they proceeded to take all of her limbs, including her head and her bowels, and put them on spikes and parade them across Paris. Now, this is the really just sick part and the part that I find really sad, and it's one of the saddest parts to the story of Marie Antoinette that I know of. Princess Lumball and her were best friends. That angry mob went to the temple, and they carried the head of the Princess Lumball, Marie Therese. And when they went through town with the head, they passed a hairdresser, and that hairdresser was forced to clean that head up, restyle the hair, redo the corpse's makeup, and then that, again, that's in that particular um, uh, hairdresser's diary and his notes that and commentary that he wrote afterwards, he stated that happened to him. And he had to do this to a corpse, and of course, the only reason that they did this to this particular corpse was they stuck it on a spike hoisted it up high, and put it at the window of the temple that Marie Antoinette was sitting inside. They taunted her. They yelled at her. They asked her if she wanted to come kiss the lips of her lover, if they wanted to see, if she wanted to see her one last time before her life was ended. So Marie Antoinette sat inside the temple, probably crying, and this is a piece that uh, I might talk about in the future, but she had, at this point, been separated from everyone in her life. Um, and I do believe her husband had been executed by that point. I need to double-check that fact. But I think he had already been executed, or was soon to be. So Marie was alone, and I'm sure the taunts were absolutely horrendous. And somehow, somehow, Marie Antoinette managed to not walk to that window and look at her friend. I find that story, that piece of that story, so sad and so creepy in so many ways, but I really admire the spirit of Marie Therese, who stood up, even though she knew she was going to die, even though she knew saying the things that she said was going to kill her, she was a true friend and a true royalist of France. So I hope you guys enjoyed my little makeup tutorial. I'm going to get better at this, I swear. Not the makeup part, but the story part while I'm doing things maybe. Or maybe I'll just continue talking when I want to talk since I get sidetracked so easily. Thanks for watching.